superhumanize. Accelerated evolution. What if everything you've been chasing, success, wealth, recognition, turned out to be the very thing standing in the way of your true happiness? What if the relentless pursuit of more is keeping you from discovering that the joy you seek has been within you all along? Today on Superhumanize, we dive deep into these questions with a guest who has not only asked them, but found answers, Ashish Kotari. Ashish is the founder of Happiness Squad and the author of Hardwired for Happiness. After spending 25 years in consulting, including nearly two decades as a partner at McKinsey & Company, Ashish made a radical pivot toward what really matters, teaching individuals and organizations how to rewire for happiness from the inside out. The goal? To touch over a billion lives and democratize happiness for all. In this conversation, we'll explore the art and science of thriving in a world designed for survival. We'll talk about emotional mastery, how purpose-driven leadership transform businesses, and why true happiness isn't about accumulating, but about aligning with yourself, your values, and your community. Whether you're an individual looking for deeper fulfillment or a leader aiming to build a happier organization, this episode offers insights that can change the way you live, work, and lead. Ashish, what a delight. Welcome to the Superhumanized Podcast. It is such a joy to be with you, Ariane. Thank you. Indeed. And just in our pre-talk before pressing record, we shared some personal anecdotes and I was just so happy to discover that small part of my life, also the geographic location was shared with where you grew up, namely mm -hmm. in New Delhi, India. And I have so much fondness in my heart for that place, even though I haven't been back. And I am just so excited to dive into everything that you teach and share with the world because it is also, I have a sense it is rooted partially also in the culture that you grew up in or the larger, the body of knowledge, philosophy, deep inner work. In your book, Hardwired for Happiness, what struck me, you bridge the gap so eloquently between this ancient wisdom and modern your science and you highlight how practices like mindfulness and gratitude literally can alter the brain structure and which also reminds me of i always read up on the newest science and stuff the latest research on neuroplasticity where these consistent mental practices have shown to reshape neural pathways and so given this powerful connection between mind and body and the knowledge that you have had over the past years and decades, what is your take on how individuals can best start to incorporate these ancient practices into their modern daily routines and in a way that it also maximizes the impact on the long-term mental health? Yeah, it's a beautiful question, Ariane. And like you, I'm a lifelong learner and a teacher, right? We try and do both. When I wrote the book, I was about 450 books deep in across spirituality, psychology, and neurosciences. Um, I'm on my 685th book now. Like I constantly read, I'm constantly learning, right? The latest and greatest, but also some of the oldest texts. When, as I went into this field area and what I really discovered was something interesting, right? That a lot of people think science and wisdom, spiritual traditions are like this Science is the truth, or really, this the, the wisdom traditions are the truth. But what I really found, first of all, was that almost all wisdom traditions, and I'm saying spiritual traditions, religions can go and in, uh, fall into that as well. The teachings are so similar. The reasons why are different, but the teachings are the same. No religion says, "Rob thy neighbor," mm -hmm. right? Nobody says that, right? Nobody no. says, want more. Nobody says, live a life focused on yourself. Nobody. And what we find is positive psychology, 20 years, they discovered exactly the same thing. They actually, I think, researched every one of these practices that show their work. 
And to your point, the neuroscientists, when they started looking at these, also saw that the reason they work is because our neural pathways change, our brain structures change. But there was something really important, Ariane, that you mentioned. They don't change by knowing. Right? We can know so much. Does not help. In fact, today we are drowning in knowledge. But we are completely parched for practice. We don't practice at all. We are so busy. We are so busy trying to survive this world that we don't create space for practice and hence nothing changes. So the key for me is exactly in how you coined it, Arya. It's in practice. And so how do we practice? How do we practice these wisdom traditions? So they become more than words on, on walls, in books, sermons, but a part of our life. And I think the way we do that, and this is what we are trying to do with our program Rewire, is we said, look, 50 to 90% of what we do is habit-based. 50 to 90%, right? So what if we actually went and looked at the science of habit formation? So I looked at the work of BJ Fogg, Charles Duhigg, uh, James Clare, and I said, let's look at how we build habits. And now imagine if we could take these nine practices and we could really help people build habits. So what we know is, look, number one, keep them small. If you go for big goals, it doesn't happen. So we literally took every one of these nine practices that are in the book and we created four to five five-minute micro practices. So we made them really small, made them really easy. In fact, when we do work, I often tell people, look, if five minutes isn't possible, make it one minute. Second, if we want to really live into them, we have to think about how we anchor and integrate them into what we do every day. Because in a world where we've made ourselves more busy than ever, right? You're not gonna find it. So I'll give you a very specific example of that. There's a lot of people who say, yeah, I'd like to meditate, but I don't have the time. Mm -hmm. And 20 years since everybody knows about headspace and calm and all, and thousands of years that people have known about it, they're not doing it. So we say, okay, fine. Here's what you could start with if you want to integrate the practice of mindfulness, right? Because meditation is just a way to practice mindfulness. Start your day. Start your day by doing two things. One, don't sleep with your phone in your room. Yeah. So you don't first time open it. 90% of the people, that's the first act in the morning is to take their phone and just give away your attention to whatever's out there. But I said, second, if you can meditate, this would be a beautiful time to meditate in the morning. But if you can't, because maybe you're a young mother, the baby's crying, or you have to get ready, there is rush, you live far away. Think about five things you do every morning, Aryan. You probably always brush. We take a shower. We make a cup of coffee. Maybe we pack lunch for kids or for ourselves. We get into a car and drive. These are five, every, more than any people do every day. Some one or more of them. So tomorrow, when you brush, just have your full attention, your awareness to the act of brushing. Right? Notice which hand you take the brush from, how much toothpaste. Notice the toothpaste which you use. Notice... Do you brush, do you wet your brush before or after? Do you take a bit of water or not? Feel the toothpaste in your mouth. Feel the flavor. Feel how it feels when the bristles touch every one of your teeth. It's the act of, it's the awareness that we can create in the present moment without judgment on intention. That's the definition of mindfulness. And so that's the second big thing in which how we can practice these, these ancient practices. We integrate them into small little pieces that we do into our day. Mm -hmm. And then the third is celebrate. So many people start journeys, and I've done this, I've seen this so many times, and they say, oh, I started off, after four days I stopped. And because I missed it, and then I missed it, and I was like, I've missed it anyway, so who cares? And I'm like, look, if you were mindful three days, that's three extra days than before you started. So just celebrate. 
And if you missed it, okay, start again. That'll be the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. So focusing on the gain as we walk this path on how much we progress, even if you just took one step, I think if we celebrate the progress versus focus, beat ourselves, feel less than, I think that is the key. That over time, we will build these into our routines. They will become second nature. We go from knowing to doing to being. And that is the key. But it all starts, Ariane, with what you said so beautifully. It's about practice. These are practices. These are not hacks. They're not silver bullets. They're not knowledge nuggets. It's all about practice. Because only by practice do we fire neurons that then wire together to become second nature, right? And as you said, it, it goes from something that you do, it becomes who you are. And I love your the aspect of playfulness. I love the aspect of celebration because it is in opposition to how a lot of us function by default, which is fear-based, which is, as you also describe in your book, we're biologically wired for perceiving threats, the negative things. Perceiving failure, of course, is, if you want to say so, is in our nature to actually put something against that, to celebrate, yes, I did this for three days, and okay, I didn't do it on the fourth, but hey, I'm doing it again the next day. And to see the bigger picture. And what I also love is how the mindfulness that you describe is very different from this superficial form of mindfulness that you often hear as a buzzword nowadays and the authenticity of it to really be in the moment. There's a, a little trick I want to share, especially with the brushing. And I also love so much what you shared about integrating it into things we already do. So it's not so we don't feel like, oh, I need to do something else on top of all the things I'm already doing. You just integrate it. You just stack it with a habit yes. that you already have. For example, brushing your teeth in the mornings and to really be in the now, if you are right-handed, start brushing with your left. It'll yeah. be so awkward for first. But then after a few days, you notice how it's going smoother and you actually are really in the now because you're approaching something you've done thousands and tens of thousands of times in your life with beginner's mind. So you're really in the now. And these moments in our day that, that are already, we already do, they're integrated into our day, brushing our teeth, showering, making the coffee, making food of ourselves or the kids, eating food, yes. We're driving, we stop at a red light. A lot of people, what do people do today? You're at a red light, we look at our phone. Yes. Maybe we can take the red light as an invitation to just stop and take six mindful breaths. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And that also shifts us out of the survival mindset into one of thriving. And that's, for me, is so compelling what we just talked about also, especially in the light of the evolutionary biology that suggests that our brains are wired for fear seeing threats, survival, and that's often at the expense of long-term happiness. Speaking about that and mindfulness being such a powerful tool, Ashish, what are some other practical steps that people can take to consciously and also consistently rewire their brains from this survival mode, which we're operating based on fear and also competition, to a thriving mode that's really focused on balance, self-growth, and also collaboration? Yeah. So I think start with knowing it. Mm. I think it's really important. Start with knowing that practice matters because our brains, literally friends, in the world that we have created today, our brains are maladapted. Mm. They will keep us in survival. Ariane, as you said, our brains evolved to keep us safe, not happy. Right? They have a strong negativity bias. So the second practice that I think is a really powerful practice for us to incorporate, and I know for me, this was the game changer, Ariane. It literally changed my brain. It changed my life, was the practice of gratitude. Gratitude. See, I was a consultant, right? So as a consultant for 20 years, it's my job to go into a company and be able to find the opportunities. 
so you can get me into the best place and I will find the opportunities, right? Once you do that for a living, guess what? You start finding opportunities no matter where you are. You find them in relationships, you find them in your house, you find them in your car, you can, right? Because you start to look for what's not good. So already our brain is wired to look for not good and now you further, I, in my case, they got further amplified. So gratitude is one of those practices that we know from research. Even if you grow, do gratitude practice once a week. Once a week, we write down three things that we are grateful for in our journal. Over six to eight weeks, you will experience a significantly more positive emotions, higher life satisfaction, lesser anxiety and depression, research done by Sonia Lubomirsky, and so many others. And friends, here's why it happens. So for a moment, I invite you to think about this. Let's imagine, let's assume there is something that you're struggling with physically, okay? Think about how big of an impact it has on our day. Maybe I've hurt my leg or my back is hurting. And if somebody asks you, how are you? Oftentimes, we're very quick to tell them, oh, I'm fine, but my back is hurting. So notice how granular we get quickly. My back is hurting. My leg is broken. I have a headache, right? So we get very specific. But if somebody asks you, how are you doing? How's your health? Oh, good. We're very quick. So when we are healthy, or if when people start doing the gratitude practice, Ariana, I ask them to start to do a gratitude practice. And I ask them, write down five things you're grateful for. Mm -hmm. They say, I'm grateful for my health. I'm grateful for my relationships. I'm grateful for the house I live in. Think about it. I'm grateful for my health. Mm. A gross generalization. And they forget in that moment to get so much more than they could get from it. Can you see? More than how many millions can't see today? Their biggest wish in life would be that they could see for one day. Mm. If you can hear... How many people are born deaf or go deaf? If you can taste, if you can walk. Anybody who's living, you're in LA, I'm in Boulder, right? How often do we find people who are complaining about something in their life? I was talking to somebody and they said, I lost my job. And it's the end, like it's it really, I'm so sad. I can't believe it. Everything is over. And I said, okay, let's do a little bit of an experiment together. Because this is how when things are not well, because we will face suffering in life, things are not going to go the way we want. But this is a classic example of how fixated we can get from it, get into it, and how gratitude can help us shift away from it without necessarily avoiding what needs to be done. So I asked him, I said, would you trade your job for your wife? He said, that's the very stupid question. What do you mean? <laughs> of course not. I said, you just said your life, like you were like, you were like, you were in the worst situation in your life. I said, what about your kids? He said, come on, let's, can we stop? No, this is my job. This is all it is. It's not this. They are the ones that matter. I said, okay, what about your health? What part of your health, maybe one part of your health, you're willing to give up because you really, this is more important. And it's nothing. I said, so just notice. In this moment, you are suffering the loss of one thing, but you're forgetting how much more you actually have. And by the way, okay, maybe if you just lost a job, think about would you switch places with anybody who might right now be in Ukraine? or in Gaza, or any of the other places where not only did they lose their job, but they lost their savings, their house, maybe even a family member, they are displaced, and they are now a refugee, and somebody was in the same role as you are. So again, it's perspective, but the perspective, I think we can tune into that, Ariane, if we deliberately practice starting to count our blessings. Yeah. Right? I do the same work in organizations. Many times organizations, one of the biggest reasons why people leave is because they don't feel valued. Mm -hmm. The other reason people leave is because they say, oh my God, I hate this place. I have X, Y, and Z that's not working. 
they forget about all the things that are actually so good and that they have. So I literally go through and I ask managers once a week, when you do your status reports, go around and ask people, hey, who are three people you would want to thank this week who made a difference? Mm-hmm. They can be internal and external and go call them. Again, I'm big on how we can integrate these practices into what we do every day rather than do things outside of it. And just like that, we can integrate this into what we discuss every week as a team, what we did, what we gained. I say, don't think about a gap to a target. Think about the gain from last week. Mm -hmm. Think about the people who made it to have dinner with your kids. Once a week, sit down and have a conversation. Hey, what are three things that we are grateful for as a family today? This week, what are three good things that happened to us? And we can really, through this, start to shift how we experience the world. And I can tell you, it really made a difference for me. I was always an optimist, Ariane, so I could always see the silver lining on the dark crowd. But I'll tell you, this is what shifted for me. With this practice, what shifted was I stopped seeing the silver lining on the dark cloud. Mm -hmm. Instead, that dark cloud and the silver lining became just a little tiny black spot on a big canvas of white. I realized that there was no dark cloud. Really, it was a charmed life that I was leading. But yeah, that's the other practice that I think can have such a big effect if you can just start to appreciate what we have starts to appreciate. Beautiful, Ashish. Yes, absolutely. And it also filters in to something else. The more open we are to seeing the positive, literally the more positive we will see when we're in this tunnel vision of fear and also in this state of mind. And I've certainly experienced it in my life too. I've done a lot of self-work and I'm still working every day practice. It's a life practice. When we are in this state of victimhood, what is done to me, what the world is doing to me. Absolutely. So when we're there, that's all we see. And we actually miss opportunities when we open up and actually look at what we can be grateful for. All of a sudden, we may start seeing other good things coming our way and doors appearing and just possibilities. And even if you look at it from a perspective of biochemistry, what it does, it alleviates this cortisol, adrenaline constantly pumping through our bodies, which has a cascade of other side effects. You look at things like uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton teaches the biology of build, the way we perceive the world, where we put our focus. That's also what we're going to get back many fold. And I really like how you bring it from the personal to the professional, so the and also the microcosm, the macrocosm. You just mentioned also in 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 the business world, the concept of organizational happiness is also something that you advocate, and that actually challenges the more traditional metrics of business success. And you suggest that happiness, a happy workforce, isn't just a byproduct of success, but it's the driver of it. Absolutely. And the science is there to prove it, right? Mm-hmm. The science is there to prove it. So I always, when I engage with business leaders, Ariane, I say, listen, taking care of your employees, because they will all say, oh yeah, we do well-being programs. We do happiness programs. We run them. Let me tell you, we're doing this, A, B, C. And I always say, don't run your happiness programs and well-being. Yeah, you do it. But let me tell you why it's such wasted dollars. First of all, most people think about those programs as what Alex Edmonds from London Business School, he's an economist, would call a split the pie approach. If I do well, I'm going to give some to the employees. Versus what he proved in his seminal paper in 2007, that if you invest in your employees, those companies drive two to three and a half percent higher stock market returns for your shareholders. You can literally grow the pie. You don't have to worry about splitting the pie. You can Mm -hmm. grow the pie. And you know, the reason you grow the pie is because we know from research that if employees are flourishing, they are more creative. They stick around longer. They are more productive because they are operating from their mind and heart in addition to the arms and legs that the traditional approaches only get, right? You literally have the whole person. 
And so we created a framework that companies can use to really make sure that not only are they giving people individual levers like mindfulness and gratitude, et cetera, but they're really in collaboration with their teams, working on the organizational factors that come in the way of flourishing. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a classic example, right? You can tell somebody to be mindful all day long, but if you have too much workload, there's a lot of pressure to perform, you have not done the work to connect meaning to what somebody is doing, personal meaning. Why do they care about more than earning a paycheck? They'll always stuck in survival. You're not going to make a difference. And so we do a lot of work, Ariane, with organizations. In fact, we're doing some work right now with Danone. We're doing some work with PepsiCo. We're doing some work with the city of Fort Collins now. All around how, as an organization, can we really integrate the individual and team-based practices to just change how we are working? Because fundamentally, when we invest in happiness and work well-being of our people, everything improves. Return on assets improve, profitability improves, productivity improves. Because, friends, just check in with yourself. When are you at your best? Are you at your best when you're angry, stressed, resentful, exhausted? Or are you when you're happy? So it's a very personal, you can do your own research uh, of uh, what is at your best because the science of happiness and flourishing is the science of human performance. Mm. It's at the heart. If we want to be our best selves, we need to learn to fundamentally rewire and evolve our brain to be happier. And by the way, Ariane, I love the name of your podcast, right? Superhumanized. I was about to launch, I was going to create a post. I haven't done it yet. So your listeners get to hear it first. I was going to, I was going to create a post that said, what's so great about being human anyways? Because there's so many people who talk about human-centric cultures and we need to be more human. And I was going to literally create this post and say, what's so great about being human? Really, that's a really open question. What's so great about being human? Why are we like, what's so great? So let's think about, let's, you know, if we have to say dog is a man's best friend, mm -hmm. right? Why do we say dog is a man's best friend? Or say, if you want to learn happiness, go look at a dog. Because when you come home, 90% of the dogs will wag their tails, they're so happy, right? They're always, they don't judge you, they're right there. So it's fine. So if you say dogs are man's best friend, they're happy. So let's talk about what is being human is being blessed with a brain that is always searching for fear and keeping us safe rather than happy. <laughs> 80, that's, that's our brain. That's where it's evolved. But we're living in a world where there is more psychological threats coming at us uh, yep. than there were physical threats in the past. So we are in adrenaline and cortisol, full-on fight, flight, freeze. We did this research where 70% of leaders during the day are in fight, flight, freeze almost all day because of all the problems. They're going from one problem to the next and we're always on. That is the state of being human. Yes. Right. If you look at the state of being human from the side of the research done at Harvard, so they have been studying the world of complexity and how our world is getting more volatile, more uncertain, more complex. And when they looked at the stage of adult development, how we develop as adults, what they find is only 20%, 20% of humans are at a stage of development that allows them to thrive in complexity. Wow. Do they have the data of where these 20% are, for example, geographically located, what age they're at? That would be some... Yeah, so they're all over. It's not necessarily geographic in age, but it's whether people have invested in the stage. So they talk about these five stages of development. The lowest level is childlike wonder. We all go through it. The next stage is our teenage years, Ariane which is we all of a sudden start to realize that, well, Ariane doesn't see the world the same way as I do. That means one of us is right, one is wrong. That's why with teenagers, and we have a teenager right now, like I have to remind myself that he's not at a stage of development to really understand what I'm saying. All he knows is what he's saying. 
he can't even hear. That's called a self-sovereign stage, mm -hmm. right? Many people, even those who are way older, can be stuck in that stage. I'm right, you are wrong. Black mm -hmm. and white. Yes. There is no other way, right? They just won't. And you're like, wow, like, how can that be? That's just because that's where they are. Then there's a stage that almost most people go through. Most people, not all. Most people go through, they become socialized. Because you realize that we are also social beings. And if I'm not going to belong to a group, it's going to be a pretty lonely existence. So we start to form our values, our beliefs, and we start to take all of that from a group. It can be from a religion. It can be from a particular this is how it is in our culture. This is how it is in my family. This is how it is in my function. This is what my leader believes. And they call that state the socialized state. The next level, if we choose to develop, is what you get into is what's called self-authored, which means not only can I make sense of what I'm being told in the group and others' perspective, but I've also started to really know my true north, my value. I've developed my own inner compass of what's right and what's wrong. And then the final stage, which about 5%, 1 to 5% are there, which is the self-transforming, which is I can hold all of that and yet I can hold that I can still be wrong. I was going to say, but this is where the beauty is, right? So 20% are at that stage of self-authored or self-transformed. So I'd say, what's so great about being human? If 80% of us are only stuck in survival, why do we want to be human? And then people say, yeah, you're not getting in. What I'm talking about is only as humans do we have the capacity to love, to be compassionate, to take care of each other. Like when we talk about human, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about to consciously grow. And I say, if that's what we are talking about being human, those properties are actually not human at all. Every sentient being has that. Yes. We know rats in experiments when they're in cages, try and free up their friends. Mm -hmm. We know chimpanzees, groom others. We know dogs, lick others' wounds if they are hurt. Trees, aspens, and other trees in the forest, if another part is hurt, will send nutrients. So what we are talking about being human is actually something that is really present in all sentient beings. And so that's why I love, Ariane, the name of your podcast, because I say what we need, literally this is what I was going to write, I don't think being human is enough. We need to invest to become superhuman or more than human. Because I don't think being human is enough. We will be, we are, we will only be stuck on survival. We will yes. only be stuck on survival. Yes. And that's something, that's a passion, a deep passion we both share. I'm an eternal optimist. I believe in humanity 2.0 and I believe in growing this seed that we have and growing from this survival mode into the self-actualization and a lot of that also has to do with, interestingly enough, some of the people who said, oh, being human is being compassionate, caring, this and that, where you rightfully said, this is intrinsic in all sentient beings. To include the plant kingdom, to include the kingdom of fungi and all the other kingdoms, cooperation. This exactly. This deep, deep sense that we're all part of one beautiful thing, if you so want to call it, whatever you want to call it, right? So I am a big believer in it. That's a big part of what drives me also to support individuals with the tools that can help us all evolve. It's an evolution. It's a revolution, if you so want. There are, of course, also a lot of tendencies for devolution. And if we want to look at that briefly, Ashish, especially if we look at the impact of technology. Now, mm -hmm. Very positive. I like all the good things technology brings to us. But as we well know, technology is as good as the people operate. Yes. It depends on what state people are in. Yeah. So it, 
Technology offers us great tools for connections and growth. It also poses significant risk for our mental health, right? And addiction is, is another negative facet of this. And we're in an election year in the U.S., so technology is used massively to spread more division, to spread more like, oh, they, and to not like somebody else because they think differently from you. I'm curious what you take as Ashish. Uh, technology is obviously here to stay. It's not going anywhere. And how do you suggest, what is the best way for individuals to actually strike a balance between leveraging technology for personal growth and also to avoid potential pitfalls like distraction and also disconnection, like we're witnessing again at an even deeper level right now? It is such a beautiful question, Ariane. And there's a reason in our model, awareness is at the heart of it, of all nine practices, right? And even this piece with technology, I think step number one of anything starts with awareness. I think most people are unaware of how this technology that we've created to help us, if we don't consciously use it, actually ends up hurting us. Let's take the example of, of phones and smartphones, right? Over the last 20 years, as I said, when we started, one of the first practices we get people to start with is letting their phones out of the room. In the last 20 years, we've all become dopamine addicts. Yes. We've given away our ability to stay with anything, with anyone, right? And the next time you go for, for dinner outside, just look around. You have couples with phones, you have families sitting with phones. They're not even there. We're not enjoying the food. We're not enjoying each other, right? So I think number one, we have to start with recognizing, like for example, how we've given our own freedom to choose to wear, to be where, to smartphones. Because once we recognize that, we can then start to do something about it. So say, how do we actually overcome it? We have so much loneliness in the world. And we're like, why are we so lonely? We have all this connection. I remember 20 years ago, I used to love roller coasters. I was in Six Flags. And I remember when you went to a roller coaster, you stood in a line and there were no phones to keep you busy. So what did you do? You looked around. You built up anticipation of the ride. You were getting more and more. Your heart started to beat a little bit as you got closer. You connected with other people around you. You said, hello. How are you? You shared a joke. You maybe found you love the same team or you went in somewhere. By giving ourselves to the phones, we've literally created this little prison for ourselves. And that's why we have loneliness. So it all, number one, starts with awareness. It starts with awareness around in what way is technology helping me? And in what way is it hurting me? I'll give you another example, Ariane, of technology, which is a really big one, and I think it's worth uh, thinking about. If we look at, you even talked about me and you. I think in this world, with algorithms only showing Ariane things that you like and you agree with and showing me things I like and I agree with, we've all lost the perspective of the full picture. In fact, we have this belief. I had somebody on our podcast, Diana McLean, she wrote this beautiful book called The Space Between Us. Where she said, hey, the reality is that America is not as divided as the news and social media makes it out to be. There are all these people in the middle who are trying to actually weave the fabric back. And we have literally given power to the extremes on the other side who are tearing us apart. So again, would we pretend, would we want to be completely programmed because we are only being fed one side? If we know it, if we know in all these different ways that technology is hurting us, we can start to do something about it. We can start to literally change our habits that are making us unhappier. We can start to take action. So for example, there are four or five things that I strongly encourage people to, again, do their own research, but start to do. Don't start with your phones in the morning. Nature gave you this beautiful gift we all got this beautiful gift. We are forced in the night for our parasympathetic system to be on. Our sympathetic system is way lower. 
if you wake up and the first thing you do is to look at your phone, moment you wake up, you lose that liminal space, that beautiful space of creativity, that natural way. You're basically forcing yourself to give ice baths every morning, a shock. And if you do it by choice, that's great. But imagine somebody waking you up with a bucket of ice. That's what you're doing to your brain. You're literally putting yourself in fight, flight, freeze in the morning. Yes. And Ashish, something I want to add to this, because you suggested prior in our conversation when you talked about meditation and you said, if you can do it right after you wake up, it is because while we're in that liminal space that you just spoke of, that is when meditation, or also if you want to go into a manifestation practice, anything else, has the most profound... Absolutely. Thing. Yeah. Absolutely. The second thing we talk about in terms of technology is I say, hey, listen, at least... If you really wanted to, at least an hour before, but even if it is not an hour, at least five minutes, you go to bed. I invite people to do something, which is have your phones, have your screens, everything away, take a piece of a journal and literally either write down three things you're grateful for or write down what are three good things that happened today. Or if you can't do any of them, read something spiritual, you pick or something philosophical and really allow yourself to journal, just write one page. What's the learning here for me? Right? And again, the beauty is if you fall asleep with your phone, which many people do, or thinking about all those, all that negativity and fear is what's going from the conscious to the unconscious in the, in, in the brain when you sleep. If you plant instead something positive, that's what starts to strengthen and take hold overnight as you sleep. Right. So these are all these different ways in which we can actually use technology or and where it is not serving us, um, start to take it away. Right. When we see a lot of violence on TV, we are taking that with us. Right. We, for example, if you read the news, don't believe the first story you read. Go look at four other stories. In fact, look for counteracting evidence for that. You ask yourself this question, how can I be wrong? Don't just watch CNN, go see Fox, read BBC, go even read something completely in another country who might give you a very different perspective. Don't just look for confirmation bias before you choose it. 100%, Ashish, 100%. And uh, most of us are not in the habit of that because like you also mentioned before, we are dopamine addicted. It's very hard for a lot of us to actually be in a state where we feel uncomfortable, right? We to it's we've become not accustomed anymore to the bigger picture. And I think it's so vital to expose ourselves to other viewpoints, other opinions. Doesn't mean we need to like them. It doesn't mean we need to agree with them, but to be able to coexist and accept that while our path might be the most beneficial, for us, at least at any given moment in time, that for other people, another path is of more benefit. That's also something I was fortunate. I literally learned that growing up in so many different countries amongst other and in, in the beautiful India, that there are so many different roads you can walk on. And as long as you don't hurt somebody else, as long as there's consent and well, it's all good. Live and let live. <laughs> That's exactly right. And it all starts with awareness. I think we really need to be thoughtful about every piece of technology we use, how it helps, how it hurts, what's the cost, so that we make the cost, we pay the price willingly versus unknowingly falling into something, mm -hmm. right? There is so much, there is so much. I think without technology, we wouldn't be where we are. Right. Like I was the first to adopt chat GPT when it came up because of course, right. Why not? If I can reduce my research, I need to do to 70, 80%. I could get a starter on something I want to do much faster. It behooves me to use it. Now I always check the facts on whatever comes out of that thing, because I have no idea what is what's behind it, but at least it starts to create forms. But I think again, it's really knowing it's truly knowing. There was this beautiful movie that came out. I'm sure, Ariane, you've seen it and you're, you might have even talked about it on the show called The Social Dilemma. And there's a line in that movie that I still remember. It said, if you're not paying 
for the product. You are the product. Yeah. Right? If you're not paying, if you're not paying something, you are it. And it's so true. We don't realize. Don't take, you never take something free. You always get curious about what is it that I'm saying yes to. Yeah. So. Yeah, for sure. And all the information that is garnered from us, whether we use, I don't know, Facebook or TikTok or ChatGPT or whatever else. I, I recently actually was just curious because due to the many things that I'm interested in, that I work on, and whether it's a professional interest like for the podcast or some of the various companies my husband and I own in the health and wellness space, I have huge curiosity about everything. And sometimes the most random things, if I said morbid thing, well, I was curious. I was like, oh my goodness. I asked ChatGPT, so please go through all of the threads that we've had and write a personality profile about me. And I was like, okay, this is going to be something like on the FBI's most wanted list or the manual for different health conditions. <laughs> it was actually quite, quite benign. Oh, so, okay. Maybe she not that bad. But to the point, it is, we are the product when something is for free. And even if we pay for it, even if we do pay for it, the amount of information we share often not knowingly nothing is private anymore really if we look at the role particularly of technology with regard to the future of happiness and looking at all these emerging and very much already having taken a hold in our life trends like a or virtual reality what do you think the impact will be for Mental health interventions, how can these technologies have a great impact on that? And what are also the potential downsides? Yeah, look, if we use, there, as I always fundamentally believe, there is nothing good or bad. It's the consciousness that wields a sword can do a lot of good, a sword can do a lot of bad, right? An axe can be used to chop wood and can be used to chop heads. One is pretty good, keeps us warm and safe. The other one, not necessarily. So I think it's about how consciously we use technology. Now, the opportunities are massive. I'm a huge, I'm always looking, Ariane, like you at latest and greatest what's coming up. So I'll give you an example. Three of the things that I use, these are not even new. They've been around for a while. I'm a big fan of Muse. Mm -hmm. Muse is a band that you put on your head that literally looks at the waves, at what alpha, beta, theta are you meditating, plays a beautiful bird chirp if you are actually finding that moment of stillness. And you can really use, for those who have no idea if I'm good or bad, like those stories of meditation, really powerful way to train. Heart math, another one of those. If you're wondering if you sleep well, sleep is one of the most important things that are at the heart of our health and happiness. Get an aura ring or use an Apple Watch and start to track the quality of your health. If you don't know what the foods you eat are doing to you, get one of the ACG monitors and you can start to actually see what's happening and how your body reacts in terms of glucose and others. So there is so much there, right? If we use it consciously, we can use it for our physical, we can use it. I'm a, we have literally, you're gonna laugh, but we literally have the Peloton, we have the Tonal, we have Apple Fitness that's on the TV. We have all right. We have all of them. We have a walking treadmill. We've got the whole gym here. It wasn't possible five years ago, 10 years ago. I think these are, again, things that can be really good. Now, if there is only dust on my tonal or the peloton is being used as a clothes hanger, then, you know, maybe not so, right? It's, again, up to what we do with it. So I think there is actually lots. And, you know, for us, in terms of what we are building, what we are excited about, I truly believe that with advancements in biometrics and biosensors, combined with learning and natural learning capabilities, language processing, as well as real-time rapid compute cycles, I truly believe we are at the cusp of a massive revolution in how we can use technology to arm human beings. We can literally give, and that's what we are building. That's what we are working on. How can we really give humans Iron Man suits so that they can truly amplify their full potential? 
because they are more aware of their own, right? We can actually, through biosensors, through what's in the water, through conversations that are happening in a company level, start to make sense and start to come up and recommend really specific practices that will move the needle, that mm. continues to get smarter. So those are the potentials that are possible. We can also use technology for a lot of bad, as you and I both know. But I'm actually overall very excited about the potential, but I'm also very worried because technology in the hands of somebody who's not conscious and wants to do evil. Look, 20 years, like Facebook, I fundamentally believe in this. Facebook could have been the biggest gift to humanity. It could have been the biggest gift to humanity if only it was wielded from a place of consciousness, of making a positive impact, right? And it is massive. Instead, now it's become this massive driver that is creating polarization, which has productized human beings, right? Like it's, I hope that doesn't happen to AI. I hope that hasn't happened to gene hacking. I hope it doesn't happen to gene profiling. All of these things, there is a huge, there is a case that we start to create this division around it. So I really hope that we, through our investments, through the work, create more Patagonias, less gaps, both make products that are clothes. One, the earth is the shareholder. They do a lot of good. The other, we're just creating piles and piles of clothes that are going into land landfills. Uh, um. So that would be my answer for technology, long-winded. But in general, I do feel what we are trying to do, Ariane, and I think what with your work, with what you and your husband are doing, I think at the heart of it, I think we've got to really focus on very quickly shifting a much large number of people to be more conscious, to really like uplift, retrain, rewire brains away from fear and scarcity into joy so that we can create better outcomes, right? We can choose, we can spend our money on brands that are actually doing good versus bad. We can be more conscious. I think the only way we do it is if we do work like this and reach billions of people. A hundred percent, Ashish. And it is so true what you said and investing into brands that actually are not destructive, but supportive of the planet is one thing. And also, I believe people should enjoy their lives, their fruit of their labor. I do also believe that redefining success and status symbols is very important. So Absolutely. Where instead of, okay, um, I got this $200,000 engagement ring, look how it sparkles. Why not whip out 10 photos of, hey, for my engagement, I built these 10 schools in an area of the world where new schools are really needed. So let's, how can we first, how can it's, this is also what I really love about your work, Ashish, your, your redefining success as something that's rooted in internal fulfillment rather than external achievements. And that's actually a profound shift for many of us who were raised with very different ideas. And what you're speaking of very much echoes the work of thinkers like Viktor Frankl, who emphasized the importance of meaning over material success. Absolutely. I would like to know from you, Ashish, how do you see that people could start the process of actually redefining their personal metrics of success? And especially if they already spent decades chasing ideals that traditional markets and advertising have put upon them. Look, I think, by the way, I will tell you this. I am for sure not for, I am, I like comforts. Mm -hmm. I like this, like for sure. So I'm completely not for, hey, go live uh, the monastic life. Look, if the difference is the following, right? So I'll just take your example. Look, if you want to buy a $250,000 engagement ring, great, no problems, go do it. But just make sure, are you... Letting things that you have define you? Or are you spending your money to enjoy it because you can and you want to? Mm -hmm. One can be very harmful because I know folks who will say, oh, look, somebody told me, oh, look, I got a Patek Rilin. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Why are you showing? No, you don't know. It's $35,000. 
I said, <laughs> okay, that's fantastic. So the point is, yeah, your watch tells the same watch and my watch. The time is the same. So no, but it's, I'm like, I'm, what are you trying to tell me? You've arrived and you've arrived because you have a watch. It's an example of, look, if we are driven by things that are defining us, then they're not good. If there are things we like to enjoy, go for it. Go make it happen, right? Like Fantastic. If you text Philippe, if that person would have told you, oh God, just the mastery of watchmaking and oh, it's just so intricate and beautiful and the history. So if it's something that they just really love and gives them joy and, and they derive a certain kind of meaning or energy from it, beautiful. But if it's just, oh, it was $35,000, again, not my place to judge, but I'm completely with you. Yeah, exactly. So I think step number one, I think to your point of this, starting to redefine for yourself, right? Only we can do it. It's a very personal journey. And I think the step, the first place we start, Ariane, is by actually examining I say there's a couple of exercises I talk about in my book. In fact, you're, those who are listening, if they go to happinessquad.com slash gifts, they can download this worksheet. Step number one, I say, is literally you use this worksheet to do the following analysis. It has four dials. It is very simple. It's a life dashboard. And it says you decide the zero or the hundred on these four dials. Again, no judgment, whatever you want, right? The first dial is wealth, mm -hmm. or you can call it work. The second is health. The third is love. The fourth is meaning. Wherever you are in your life right now, just step back and fill that dial. See where you feel full and where maybe you're feeling quite empty. And then from that place, then the next thing I want you to do is just say today, and again, for each one of the dials, right? So for example, take wealth as an example. For you, 100 might be a million, it might be 10 million, it might be 100 million, it might be a billion. Again, I'm not judging. Whatever your number, whatever drives it, I don't care. But put a number and see where you are. And do the same for the others, right? For some, they want to have 100,000 followers on social media. For some, they would like just five friends. Whatever it is that you define what you define as a full hundred love, right? Fill it. And then distribute on the second part of the exercise, 168 balls. 168 is 168 hours. Those are the hours we all have. It doesn't matter whether you're a billionaire or whether you're a pauper. We all have 168 hours in a week. Distribute those around these eight different buckets around the similar domains and notice what you notice. And if you notice that I'm over-invested in wealth and I might already have enough and I'm really low on love, maybe take one ball, just one, and shift it from work to family or to a friend. Reach out to a friend you haven't seen in a while. One of the most common regrets of the dying, I wish I hadn't worked too hard. Mm. Second, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. Third, I wish I'd let myself be happier. So just shift one ball, one ball, one hour. And see what starts to shift, right? So we can do this exercise. In effect, what I'm inviting you to do is take a balcony view at your own life. Very rarely do we do it. We just go from one day to the next day to the next running chores. So go do that, right? And it can be very powerful. The second one, Ariane, I often say is notice in your life where you might be struggling. Notice if there is suffering present. And by suffering, I don't mean physical pain. I mean suffering, right? Pain, physical pain, if you have it, is inevitable. Suffering is our, our own created. And just examine that, hold that part and say, what is the mental model, the belief that I have about the suffering? Mm. 
And what's the mental model behind that? And what you will find is you might find what are called these root assessments or core beliefs, these mindsets that started out helping us, but somewhere along the way are actually holding us hostage are causing a lot of pain. And that's where I think we can have a choice. Once we see their role in our lives, we can start to choose to drop them. At best, we can start to choose to put them on the side of the passenger seat rather than driver seat, right? And take us where we want to go. So I think those are, I think those are, I think the two places and to enable both of those to happen, Ariane, we have to start by finding stillness, mm -hmm. by stopping. I always joke, I heard this somewhere and I say this quite often. If aliens showed up tomorrow, they might already be living here, I don't know. But if the aliens showed up tomorrow and they looked at Earth and they said, that's a giraffe, that's a dog, that's an elephant, that's a tree. I'm not sure they would call us human beings. They would call us human doings. Yeah. Because we don't like to be still. If we really want to do inner work, we have to find stillness. We have to find silence. We have to calm and quieten our inner voices so that we can listen to the whispers that the universe and the world around us is constantly sharing with us. Go out in nature. Allow yourself to tune into the rhythms and the vibrations, which are at a much lower vibration of, of the natural world. We spent some time earlier this month in, in the Muir Woods, just mm -hmm. north of you all in California. And you look at these trees that have been around for 1,200 to 1,800 years. It's a lush forest. There is so much life there. There is so much wisdom there. There is so much space. Find those places that allow us to go deeper inwards. And if we do that, we will find the mental models. We'll recognize that we are prisoners in our own prison. We have our own keys. We can start to shed them so that we can live the life that we want versus one that is completely defined outside in based on these external markers. So those are three places where I would start. Mm, beautiful. Thank you, Ashish. These are also wonderful closing words. And for people who'd like to connect deeper with you, obviously they can, I highly recommend to read your beautiful and insightful book you. and also go to your website, happinesssquad.com. Are there any other places uh, that people could look up or find you at? Yeah. The website is the best place. If you want to bring any of this work to your organizations, if you're a leader of a company, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I post quite frequently. We also have a podcast, Ariane, the Happiness Squad podcast, where we really predominantly focus on bringing in experts and, and folks who are in this space, solution providers, who can truly help individuals and organizations make happiness and flourishing their competitive edge. So this notion of let's not burn ourselves out to do more. Let's really focus on honing our being energy to achieve a lot more. So those are the places I would guide them, but I am, I would be absolutely happy to help. This is the mission I've dedicated the second half of my life to. And I'm so glad to meet you and to be able to have this conversation together. And hopefully we find some, this is just the start of a wonderful collaboration for us. Yes. I wholeheartedly agree, dear Ashish. So good to be with you. And also thank you so much for all the great work, all the offerings you put out there for who you be. Yes, this was wonderful. And to be continued, thank you so much for making time today to join us. My pleasure.